I am delighted that all of you are here this evening. And, and, and just before we pray, who do you think has the better tree, me or Canon Hardy? <laughs> <laughs> you, you can see do we be political? <laughs> I, I vote for the Canon. <laughs> I'm not going to touch that one. Oh, nice, nice, Robert. Yep. No, I'd say that both the Canon and I have eschewed Advent practices and have gone straight to little baby Jesus. <laughs> okay. Not all Advent practices, but uh, lovely. Well, how about let's pray, friends, and we'll go from there. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with you. With you. Thank you. Let us pray. Holy One, help us to create a place for you. Help us to take that time. Help us to then listen for you, wait for you as we long for you. And when we feel your presence and your power, May we have courage, too, to live out in our lives using the gifts, the many gifts you've given us, all that you long for. And this we pray in what may be the weirdest of all Advents. In your holy name, we pray. Amen. Amen. So Sister V and I are here again with all of you, completely excited about this. Um, thought we might review again a tiny bit of history. You remember last week, if you were with us, um, we constructed a, a lovely timeline that gave us some backing and some um, context. But just, um, just for a quick bit, um, just to, to set this, um, so Brown v. Board of Education, Sister V. 1954. All right. Um, and then Montgomery Bus Boycott? 57, 58. Um, this book was written? 62 and 63. And, and then um, the Civil Rights Voting Act. Yep, the Voting Rights Act was 50, uh, sorry, 64, and the Civil Rights Act was 65. Okay, and, and for the winner on Jeopardy quiz, Sister B, Stonewall Riots. 1969. Yeah, all right, I think those are, sort of an important piece to just have um, knowing that this is when um, James Baldwin is writing um, at this particular piece. Um, so what, and put this in the chat if you would friends, just start writing away. What, um, what stood out to you um, from last week what stood out to you from um, the reading that we just went over, uh, that we read for this in preparation for this this discussion? What stood out? Thank you, Anna, for the link for the whole timeline. Whose little boy are you? There you go. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Keep going. We'll we'll come back to these. Ah, uh, the overwhelming feeling of helplessness of being a black man in the U.S. Yeah. There you go. Indeed. What else? Oh yeah, criminal power to be feared, not expected. Right, yeah, and then the white man's heaven is a black man's hell, huh? Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah, his anger against the black church in addition against Christianity as a whole. Definitely gonna look at that. What else? Yeah, white people not knowing the plight of black people. Choosing not to know. Did James Baldwin reject God when he rejected Christianity? Oh, that's a really good question. <laughs> Nothing had changed from his life to the life of his nephew. Yeah, yeah Baldwin's understanding of love. Hmm? So let's, and keep, keep writing in here, friends, but um, yeah, with that, the feeling of hopelessness of ever being able to have any meaningful social change without starting completely over. Yeah. Who was um, integration? There we go. Yeah, that was, yep, yep. Friends, who was, um, who is Baldwin? What's he, what's he fleeing from? What do you think? The Avenue? Yep, what else? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, himself. <laughs> himself. What else? What else is he fleeing from? Lack of choices. That white superior. His truth. Ha. Huh. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, I love that point where he says Jesus knows him better than he does. <laughs> he knows himself. <laughs> it's like, oh. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, so James Baldwin, I mean, fleeing from moral apathy, yeah. And cruelty of power. That's right, because there's this line where he says, you know, he can't sing. He's not going to be a prize fighter. He doesn't have the, he had believed too many stereotypes at that point to actually dare to think that he could be a writer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So here he finds himself, you know, in adolescence, you know, 14, 15, 16 years old, discovering who he is, but at the same time discovering the strictures of the world that he lives in. You know, he's discovering that in that in, in a white society, he is in this one place that he's not supposed to get out of. And, you know, that's if adolescence isn't bad enough <laughs> to becoming aware of himself and to becoming aware of himself as a gay man in this context. I mean, even more strictures than than he would have faced otherwise. You know, that's that's where he finds himself and all of a sudden trying to figure it out. What does it mean to be who I am, where I am? What are my possibilities? And coping with that sense of sinfulness, um, just sort of because of his, as he keeps talking about his desires and, and his dreams at night and, um, yeah. and just being 15. Just being 15 uh, in, in a conservative black church. I mean, whatever those feelings are when you're, when you're a teenager, they're all sinful. <laughs> yeah. And, and you're right. I mean, he's also very much so running away from his father. Um, yeah. 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 So what are his, what, what are his options? Yeah, the options he sees, oh my goodness, he sees, 
Well, he sees the avenue, like was pointed out in the chat, which is basically criminality. Um, he sees, you know, just the grinding down of, of, you know, people who get decent jobs but are never going to rise very, very high. His comment that, you know, he sees seeing too many college graduate handymen. <laughs> He realizes the limits that there are and, you know, even in decent employment. And um, he doesn't see it being an option as a writer because that doesn't happen to people like him. And where else do you flee? He finds the church or the church finds him. <laughs> that question, who little, whose little boy are you? <laughs> right. right. And his and, and, and his answer, why, why I'm yours. Because oh, here's this, you know, here's this seems like welcome. You can belong here. You can, you know, you can flourish here. We'll respect you here. Um, you know, but at the same time, that's a limited space. <laughs> well, and it, it almost feels like it was, he's, he's wrapped with guilt. Um, and, and he has that moment of coming, coming to Jesus because he hasn't been saved, um, which I don't know if any of you guys had evangelical um, friends. You know, I, 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 you know I, spent, I had all these Southern Baptist friends in Virginia and they're always wondering when I was gonna be saved. And I'm like, I'm Catholic. Um, and you know, I didn't have the heart to tell them that I thought they weren't going to heaven. So, I mean, I was like, I'm Catholic. Um, and I, I actually was more sophisticated than that, but I always thought, well, how, when do I get Jesus? How do, how do, how do I get Jesus? Um, and that's another story because um, on some level, my experience as a, of a kid's Curcio is, is how I got Jesus. But, um, but I'm thinking about him going and doing that altar call. And what an overwhelming experience that is. You know, it's, it's physical. It's, you know, it's very much in the body. You know, here's, here's a way where he can feel his physical energy that's not sinful. <laughs> you know, so it's this overwhelming, you know, sense of emotion and physicality that, that this altar call is. And when everything else is being told sinful, wow. As a, as a teenager with all of that extra energy that you've got going around, here's a place for it to be ex expressed. And, and, that, and, and, and did he, didn't he say, I mean, he stayed there all night long and they prayed for him? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a witness, mm -hmm. right? I could, I could see like, I'd be like, uh, you know, I gotta go home. Could you get up? <laughs> I mean, but there's, there's this sense of, no, we're gonna save you. We're gonna we're gonna pray, and and he said I think he said and then when he got up they said you've been saved. It's done. Great. <laughs> yeah. And and isn't that in many ways with his sermons, I mean that's that's where he finds his salvation in the writing. At least a sense of it. Mm -hmm. a, a bit of it do you think? Yeah. Well, here's one place he can write. And I, I think um, yeah, that sort of gets us into the place of, wow, well, what does the church actually allow him, allow him to be and to do? Um, you know, I think the, one of the questions is, did he reject Christianity when he re rejected the church? Well, there's a sense of the church is a place where, you know, white society says, here's a place where you can have authority, you can have respect, but don't try to have it anywhere outside of that. Um, you know, it's, it, that's, and that's a difficulty I think that all black people have to deal with when we're thinking about the Christian church is it can be um, a reaction to and a product of white slaveholders Christianity. It can still be a mechanism of keeping him in his place. I think that's what one 
one phrase he uses that yeah this was this was this could be another way of keeping me from you know searching for power and authority and voice any uh, anywhere outside of the church what exactly happened when he fell before the altar i don't understand that mm. <laughs> You know, I, I, I am not a cradle Episcopalian. Um, I didn't grow up in a charismatic church, but half of my family did. And there was this sense that you weren't saved until you were completely overcome by the spirit in that way, where you just had this complete physical reaction that was interpreted as an encounter with God and you were saved. It was considered the norm. I mean, it was not unusual to have that kind of really dramatic encounter. Um, it might get some attention if you did that in Episcopal Church, but you know. <laughs> it happens in all of my visitations. <laughs> it's just harder to see them online. <laughs> But yeah, that would have been, that would have been expected as part of being saved is to have that just overwhelming response to the altar call. I don't know. Does that help, Barbara? I think that's. I mean, I think it is that sense of I'm overwhelmed with my fear. I'm overwhelmed with my guilt. My sense of being a sin-filled um, person, and. Um, and no one talking about sensuality or sexuality. And particularly if this is happening for um, a, um, an adolescent who identifies as gay, but in 1962, that's why I said, you know, when was Stonewall? Stonewall's is 69. I mean, and it, that, that has moved so much so much has happened in the last 20 years about that. But go back 40, 50 years, that's, it's a hard, it's a double hard world. And someone mentioned, you know, yeah, I saw someone slain in spirit at the Episcopal Church in Los Alamos. Oh, great. Okay. Yep. <laughs> yep. My parents were charismatic Catholics, which... I, I never went to the services they did. Some of my siblings did and their stories was, that was enough for me. <laughs> what, say more, say more about this notion of how um, the white, the, the white, world um, allows or lets be, um, in his mind, the Black church um, and, and, and lets it be this place or ha as he experienced it. I'm not yeah. sure if I'm being very articulate there. Yeah, well, I mean, he starts tell, he he's telling these stories about his encounters with, well, with police, you know, and, you know, being shoved to the ground and being, you know, having slurs <laughs> yelled at him, you know, and his experience of the white world was one of humiliation and, and you know, abuse and subjugation. But, you know, particularly for Christianity in the sense of being a product of the slave, white slaveholding Christianity. Here was a place where as long as you stayed there in that realm, you could have power and authority and voice, but do not try to have that outside of the church in the white world. So it's kind of like, this is your place to have that feeling. Mm -hmm. Enjoy it there. <laughs> Don't try it out here. <laughs> And, and then and then the limiting of uh, it, it it and and this might I think you said this this might get to the point of of being holy that we were talking about earlier that 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 sense of you that I wait for the by and by 
And then when I die, it will be good. And this is how I'm going to get through. And so it's not, it's not a theology at that point in his context that was pushing people, as he said, to go have a red strike. Yeah. So, I mean, this was kind of the, I guess the acceptable kind of church for the white world. But at the same time, you have a church movement that's going, that's behind the civil rights movement, which is very much getting out of the place where they're supposed to stay. So, I mean, you can look at, at the black church that Baldwin is encountering as another stricture, as another, another box to keep him in his place. Practice your holiness there, be saved, follow this, you know, sort of moral rigor <laughs> that keeps you off the streets, that keeps you away from criminality, but at the same time doesn't lead you to challenge the white world outside of that church. Where simultaneously you have the civil rights movement very much challenging the white world from a place of Christianity. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like there's these two parallel um, senses of church going on. One that kind of keeps the status quo and keeps, keeps white people comfortable. And then there's the church that really discomforts white people and, and is just outside of the walls. It's outside of the ghetto. It's literally in 1963, marching on Washington. <laughs> Yeah, slave preaching. Ooh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So what what's he learning? What's he learning about himself in the preaching? Just a Wow, having having a voice. Having well and getting attention. Having right. those, Yeah, cuz he's yeah. young brother Baldwin, right? Right, yeah, all of a sudden he's, he's got this position, he's got this place, you know, this, he's got this sense of authority and voice. Yeah, a title. And youth. <laughs> yeah. And he, um, there's this point too where he talks about how he had three sermons he had to get done so he didn't have to listen to his father. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, all of a sudden he's got this, you know, vocation where, you know, his his father, who's fairly authoritarian, has to respect it and has to stay out of his way. And we were talking earlier, I mean, what teenager doesn't want to have that, you know, that kind of comeuppance on their parents? <laughs> I've got something that you can't interfere with. And, you know, there he is, a, a teenage boy who... Um, you know, who gets to tell his father, I'm doing something that you can't interrupt. But then as we're, we're seeing in the chat, then when he, when he's in school and his best friend is Jewish, and then he, he's trying to reckon that, that start, that, you know, that Jesus being Jewish coming out of that, and then his tracks that he's passing out. And when he starts to read them and learns, realizes that he can't actually believe any of the tracks unless you already believe. Yeah. And then it comes to a head when he, he has that altercation with his father. And he says, he says, my Jewish friend is more of a Christian than you are. You know, which is, it, that's kind of that, I guess that sort of separation between what the church is saying and what Baldwin is coming to realize he wants from a relationship with God. He doesn't want this kind of narrow sense of salvation that the church is, is preaching. He's looking for something broader and beyond. Yeah. And something that, that isn't like he saw in his father and, and what he saw with, he said he, he knew how the, he saw the behind the scenes with the preaching. So he knew what that was and he knew how he worked himself into um, visions. Yes. 
Right. So there's also, there's this, so it's, it's like, he's afraid of the avenue of the grinding, um, of the grinding poverty. He's afraid of himself and his sexuality. He, he finds salvation in the church. He begins to discover part of himself in the church and then in the church because of his connection with his friends, he's, he's, dis, he's disillusioned. Yeah. Yeah, this, this idea that this was, this was supposed to be a place that would save him from, you know, I guess these, these sort of false setups and these, these kind of traps this was supposed to be his escape route, right? Since he couldn't dance and he couldn't sing, here's another <laughs> escape right, route. Right. He wasn't going to be a prize fighter. Right. He wasn't going to be a prize fighter. But all of a sudden, he's beginning to realize it's not that escape route. It's actually something else. And it's something that he can't quite be 100% behind. Yeah. Um, let's, 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 let's hold this for a minute and then, um, and we'll go back to some of these questions, but how, um, we, we were talking about, and, and Sister V, you were talking about some folks who reach out to you afterwards about about last week's conversation and the difference um yeah you know it, it i realized we know when we when we chose this book way back in august believe it or not <laughs> that was you know, five first, years ago in covid time yeah <laughs> but like the first two books we did i loved them both i particularly wanted to study white fragility but at the same time, those were still books told through the lens of white people coming to grips with racism. This is, this is the very unique and powerful voice of a black man who's just, who's very thoughtful, who's reflective, and so poetically articulate about what it actually means to be a black man in the midst of a white society. And a very wise person who I was talking to over the, with over the weekend said, you know, this, this is a cry. And it's, it's a cry from a place of love for, an Amer for the possibility of an America that never quite gets there. You know, it's this idea of this America that could be this integrated, you know, place of, of equality and respect, but, you know, white people keep pushing it back. They keep fleeing from the reality of what America is, really is at the moment. And um, yeah, this, this, that is this cry and it's so heartfelt and it still believes in the possibility of something better, but it's coming from a place where you know, white people look at it from the outside. Um, you know, you, you're talking about, you know, this, you're used to like, you, it's like going from the parlor conversation to like the kitchen table conversation. <laughs> I mean, that, that was, and I'm wondering if you all, and put it, you know, put it out in the chat there. I was wondering if you experienced this book differently. Um, because I really did feel like it, it was the difference between sitting in someone's sort of like very proper living room, right? And then, and then we'd gotten past that and we'd walked into the kitchen and we didn't worry about the china anymore. We just had, we had the regular, the everyday mugs and we were having coffee and, and this was a different, this was a different way of taking in information for me. I, I felt, um, well, I felt like an outsider looking, watching, listening. Um, 
So I, I, I wonder how, what other, if other people had different experiences of it. Yeah, the voice is singular and absolutely also the quality of the writing, <laughs> praise hands, such <laughs> energy and movement and depth of feeling. It's very visceral. Yes, yeah. Like book link sermon, but a really good sermon. Sermons <laughs> <laughs> are good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that sense that he 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 just conveys so well the evolution of learning who he is. Yeah. 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 Um. And I'm, I'm not sure, well, you can't really find that unless you are reading the first person account of a person of color, that evolution of, of understanding who you are within the context. Oh, read this book in 63 for literature and feel like nothing has changed. One transformative moment or was an accumulation? Yeah, I think it, I think it was a lifelong evolution. Yeah. Yeah. Who was this book for? Yeah. Well, no one's talking. Um, we're mostly commenting on this book through religious uh, glasses uh, and through uh, psychological glasses. Uh, there's a whole lot in there that I find interesting from a sociological basis. And, you know, he, he talks about how badly Blacks are downtrodden underfoot in America in the 40s, 50s, and into the 60s. Um, he doesn't give in many real great examples. I liked his example about how his relationship with uh, hotel doormen. He has a running battle with doormen. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I found was one really uh, telling example. He discussed the service of Negro soldiers in World War II in Europe and said that they went over there all fired up to go and were found that they were treated just terribly by those who should have been their comrades in arms and that other U.S. soldiers treated German prisoners better than their black fellow soldiers. And then these soldiers got back to the United States and found that they were dismissed as boy. Yeah, one of the questions in, in, in the chat was, um, it was following up, did Baldwin write this, who did he write this book, book for? And I think in the writing process, um, for a writer, this is his way of understanding who he is and understanding the world. And so he shares it because he realizes that in understanding himself, he can help other people understand the world that he lives in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to a certain extent, when, when you're writing something just really personal like this, when you're processing, you know, your own discovery of who you are, and what it means to be who you are in that context. Um, I, I think there's this realization that it can, that is a gift that can be shared. And so was Baldwin writing with any particular person in mind? I don't think so, but I think he understood that his own processing and his own working through who he was in that context 
it mattered enough to actually be presented and put out there, that his voice needed to be heard because so many other black voices were silenced. And a couple of the other comments in there about how nothing had changed. When I was re-rereading this um, before, before tonight, I was remembering a, an interview that the BBC did of a young black man in a difficult part of Philadelphia just before the election. And he said, no matter who wins, it's not gonna get any better for us. And that sense of despair is I think how Baldwin opens up this essay, this sense of this is what it feels to be trapped mm -hmm. in this one place within the society. And this is what I was trying to escape. And I, and here were my options, <laughs> you know, criminality, a grinding job that was far less than, than, you know, who he was or the church. And yeah, the fact that it really, for so many, it has not changed at all. That's a challenge to us. Yeah. And, and to see, to see where some of the changes have come from. When, you know, when I, when I think of Dr. King and the Montgomery bus boycott, and then just the whole movement that he was leading, creating and, and calling forth, I mean, that as we said before, that comes, that comes from the church. It comes from the church that is doing, is, is, you know, it's, it's not, it wasn't a rent strike that um, Baldwin was lamenting that the church wasn't doing. It was, it was better than that. It was a bus boycott. Um, but, you know, even Martin Luther King, he got some criticism from people saying, you know, why can't you just go back into your church and do what a pastor is supposed to do? which is, you know, preach in your church on Sunday and keep your people in line. Um, you know, instead of coming out and doing a march on Washington for jobs and freedom, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and as, as life was continuing for him, um, Dr. King's movement towards anti-Vietnam, um, and, and again, looking who's dying here. Yeah. What color skins of people are dying and for what? Um, because it'll be in 1967 when he makes that sermon at Riverside Church, <laughs> you know, <laughs> saying, coming out just clearly against the Vietnam War. And he certainly got a lot of criticism for that. One of his one of his early lines that struck me was, um, and it's really early in this essay, but it says that when the white person finally figures out who they are um, and learns how to accept and love themselves and each other. When they've achieved this, which will not be tomorrow and may very well be never, um, the Negro problem will no longer exist for them, for it will no longer be needed. And it is, again, this sense of um, a white person's inability collectively to understand, to love, to know, um, to know myself made in God's image and likeness, and to thus then project everything I dislike about myself on someone else, writ large, uh, moving past individual, but to collective systemic sin. Um, yeah, no longer defining themselves by, well, this is what we're better than, and this is what we're not, <laughs> but instead saying, this is who we are and we are all, we are all the image of God. 
Yeah. 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 Yeah, someone yeah. In, the, in the chat um, talked about Baldwin's relation, understanding of love. And um, I think my favorite line from this essay is the very last sentence. Ooh. And if the concept of God has any validity or any use, it can only be to make us larger, freer, and more loving. If God cannot do this, then it is time we got rid of him. <laughs> Which I think addresses that question in the chat about, well, if he rejected the church and Christianity, did he reject God? Um, I think actually he found God. <laughs> I, I think he rejected um, particularly white, but also uh, parts of the black church's interpretation and manifestation of God. I, I, I've long told people to never confuse God with the institutional church. Um, um, it doesn't mean that they should be broken apart, um, but it... it uh, Sometimes they have different agendas. <laughs> right. And, I, and the other thing I've always told folks is that the institutional church will always let you down. Not, you know, not all the time, but there's always going to be a point because it's comprised of flawed, frail, fragile human beings. And I think that's why this particular essay um, meant so much to me because I read this, gosh, I think I was in my very early 20s the first time I read this. Um, and I had to find my way out of a church that did not value me at all because I was a woman and therefore had no place actually actively in the church outside of the kitchen. Um, <laughs> but I had to find my way away from this very judgmental, angry God who basically kept a list of, you know, moral, <laughs> you know, your moral actions and to find this God who makes you, who, who, who leads you to being larger and freer and more loving and a God that is larger and freer and more loving. And so I, I, I really identified with him finding God outside of the institution. <laughs> and what a necessary step that was for spiritual growth. Because while I see him rejecting the church I see someone with a very robust spirituality. And, and that's something that I can, I can just really identify with. And, and, and what that, what that looks like, I mean, I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a bishop and I, I've, said that I would uphold the doctrine discipline <laughs> of, of the Episcopal Church um, and the traditions, right? And just to uphold that. And so to do that, but to also know that if we are going to be a people of faith who are making, who are living transformative, faithful lives, then we need to not be solely concerned with the building up and the maintaining of the institution as it is currently constructed. I'm not saying to rip it down or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. And I am saying though, that everything changed when Dr. King went outside. And I, and I am wondering about that young man in Philadelphia and I am wondering what the response is to people of faith. Um, what is that response that things have to change, but I'm not gonna bother to vote because nothing does. And so then I wonder what does that do? And how do we respond to that? Uh, black and white. 
And, you know, with the, you know, with the reading of, I well, this Sunday we get to, there's an optional for the, Mag, for the Magnificat this Sunday. Yeah. You know, talk about overturning things and changing things, you know, and, and the passage from Isaiah, you know, you're going to go and you're going to raise things up. You're going to build over the devastation. You're going to actually change things and you're going to go out and do it. You're not going to be sitting in a in a building or in, in a tiny little group of people. You're actually going to go out and make these changes in the world. And um, and that's I love that passage because of course that's the first thing that Jesus says in the synagogue in Luke, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. <laughs> because yeah. And, and how did the people react? What happened thereafter? Remember? Well, yeah. Is that what I'm trying to push him off a cliff? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. That's what I always say. Jesus only lasted three years in parish ministry. <laughs> but there is this point of when we say, all right. Now we're going to do this, where it upsets, it, it upsets the, the powers that be. As, as Jesus upset the powers that be. On, on several layers, so. Because he demanded a lot more than just piety. <laughs> <laughs> you know he really wanted that genuine love that that fire of the spirit to just be kindled in people so that they would just go out you know to be the ones sent and 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 really do that that revolution that's, that's talked about in the magnificat mm -hmm. Thank you for having me, helping me get a start on my sermon for this Sunday. <laughs> what is this saying to us, friends? What are you What are you hearing? You're reading this from your individual perspective. Now we've got about ten more minutes. Um, chime in, chat, or uh, in person. What is this saying? What are you hearing being said to you? How do you identify with James Baldwin? How do you not? What have you learned from him thus far? I hate to be too optimistic or Pollyanna-ish, but he's describing what things were like in the 50s and 61, 62. We've come a long way. You know, we haven't solved this problem, these problems, but a lot has improved. So, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna push a little bit and say, I think some has certainly improved. I'm not sure I don't know. I'm not sure how much. There seems to be so much that hasn't. From a black person's point of view, yes, I was reading the newspaper of December the 8th, 9th of what it was, 2020. Nothing has changed. Mm. Nothing. Brenda, what piece specifically were you thinking about with that? earlier in the essay yeah um all along or especially when he when he got up to where he was really back from paris yep and he was trying to find um why he left and and how nothing had changed since he left and the black white thing was still there nothing had changed mm -hmm. the struggle even from reconstruction was still there the police 
I mean, like that stood out and I wrote on everything in my house, defund the police. Mm -hmm. I am 100% behind. I, I'm more radical. I want to get rid of the police. And if you must have one, just have the chief of police. Because when the police comes for black folks, it's death. Was 50 years ago, was since, since 1867, when they made prison be served. For, so nothing has changed for me, a black female. Yeah. And Not even from when I had to study it in English Lit in college, because that was part of what we had to do, James Baldwin and Richard Wright and stuff like yeah. that. So yeah. it, was, it was reading it, reading it after 50, almost 50 years and nothing has changed. The, the man who was um, murdered in, um, was it Columbus, Ohio, walking into his house? Oh, yeah. Yeah, somewhere down there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Just because she's yeah. black and we're on the edge now because it looks like black folk has the nerve to come up like black folk are coming up. You know, it's always. Uh -oh, they're going to take us. Thank you, Brenda. We're not yeah. hearing you. Thank you. Yeah. And I, and yeah. I think that's something that hasn't changed is that you know there's still this sense of as as Baldwin put it you know this is the ghetto you're born into and this is where you're supposed to stay um there is that sense that it's just it is so difficult to get out of the place where society has said this is acceptable for for black people to be there are a few exceptions you know, but there's still exceptions. It's there's still a sense, I think, and, and the, the young man in Philadelphia that was being interviewed by the BBC makes it clear that when he when he looks around him and when he's looking at his options in life, he's really not seeing much different than James Baldwin saw. He's seeing the street. He's seeing a grinding job that will never pay him enough to you know, probably if it's minimum wage, not even survive, you know, maybe the military, which Baldwin noted, and maybe the church, but hit how much have the options changed for that young man in Philadelphia in 2020 than what James Baldwin saw in 19, you know, in the 1950s and 60s, not a whole lot. Someone in the chat writes, I learned a perspective on whiteness that I, as a white person, do not see. He shows how narrow and constricted our white view of the world is. He goes back to the first essay, that notion of innocence, and the innocence is the sin because it is claiming I do not know. And I think for me, I that last sentence and just the energy and the urgency he has that, okay, this is, this is what I see around me and this is why we've got to change. And I think that is, that also addresses the question who he was writing for. I think he had, I think he felt compelled to just be one of those catalysts to say, I'm going to put my voice out there for white people and black people to read to say this is the way things are and this is why we really have to change things. This is why we have to move out of the spaces that, you know, have been defined for us and, you know, really find this God that makes us freer and larger and more loving. Mm -hmm. Damage of 400 years. Mm -hmm. 
So friends, in this Advent, in what I've taken to calling the weirdest Advent I've ever seen, uh, as we continue this, it's a, it's a time that is very, because everything is so upended, it is a time that's rather porous. And when systems are porous and everything's ambiguous, that's when you can have change. It's an, it's an easier time to do it. So I, I invite all of us in this time as we keep on this journey of reading this book and then also this journey of Advent to think about how we individually and then as a collective group of faithful people from the Diocese of Michigan, how are we, what gifts has God given us to prepare the way for something different, something new? because I am convinced that the spirit of the Lord God is upon us. Telling the truth. And the truth will set us free as challenging as it is to face that truth. <laughs> Mr. V, closing thoughts, friend? Well, I think this is still one of the most personal um, spiritual autobiographies that I've read, ever read that means so much to me. Um, and what I love the, about the way this book is constructed, it still raises more questions. <laughs> And so next week, we'll be looking at his encounter with the Nation of Islam and how he processes and works through the idea of separatism. Huh. Um, and, you know, coming from this place of we have to learn to love each other to seeing, wow, here's, here's, a, here's Black people trying to find a way to get away from the white slaveholders Christianity, but what does it do to us as black people? So it's it's a it's a really compelling essay. <laughs> so that, in case you were wondering, is going from page 48 to 82 in this particular version. <laughs> but you'll recognize the beginning and end of the essay. Yeah. <laughs> All of you, thank you very much for being here tonight. I so, so appreciate it and really relish just doing this. And this is so weird thing, right? Last year, this time last year, if we said this is what we'd be doing, we'd be like, and, and And we'd say, my hair is how long? But, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very, very much. Sister V, will you close us in prayer? Yeah, I'm going to borrow a prayer from Pore Gotuma. Mm. Oh, I like him. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Let us pray. We know that sometimes we are alone and sometimes we are in community. Sometimes we are in shadow and sometimes we are surrounded by shelter. Sometimes we feel like exiles in our land, in our languages, and in our bodies. And sometimes we feel surrounded by welcome. As we seek to be human together, may we share the things that do not fade, generosity, truth-telling, silence, respect, and love. And may the power we share be for the good of all. 
We honor God, the source of this rich life, and we honor each other, story full and lovely. Whether in our shadow or in our shelter, may we live well and fully with each other. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you all. Next week, seven o'clock. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Uh, look at we remembered to record. You're so good. <laughs> oh God. Okay. Critique. Good discussion. <laughs>